Good morning, North Point Church. How are you doing? Oh, wait a minute. Y'all had breakfast. Come on. Yes, yes. It's so good to see each and every one of you. I'm excited to be here. As Ms. Sandra said, my name is April Farmer, and it is a pleasure to be able to be here with you. And I know some of you might be looking up here and be like, wait a minute, isn't that that girl who was singing a couple of weeks ago? That is me. I do do that as well. Um, It's funny how God shows us over time that we are gifted in more areas than we think. And things are not always what they seem on the outside. So I'm just privileged and honored to be able to share with you on today. I wanted to kind of give you a bit of my background and how I got introduced to North Point Ministries. Um, Back in 1999, I moved here after college. And in 2000, I started working for Sprint Long Distance over by Cumberland Mall. And um, one day, um, one of my coworkers told me, he said, hey, they're giving away free lunch across the street. I was like, really? They said, yeah, all you got to do is sit there and listen to a message for about 30 minutes, and they give you free lunch, mostly Chick-fil-A. And I was like, hey, that sounds wonderful. So every, I think it was a Tuesday, every Tuesday, I started going over to this hotel across the street from my job. And I sat down, and I saw this man come up on the screen, and his name was Andy Stanley. And I promise you, if you go to my house, there's this flip book, because it was a long time ago, of all these CDs of Andy Stanley teaching these messages. And so that's how I got introduced to North Point Ministries. And about eight years ago, I started um, singing at the North Point Ministry churches um, as, a, as a worship leader, and that's how I got introduced here. And so I'm really excited to be here um, and excited to share today. In addition to that, I am a a master of social work. And so I worked as a community-based therapist for several years before I came on staff at Buckhead Church about a year and a half ago. And my favorite part about that job Now, was not only that I just got to interact with a whole lot of people, kind of go to where they are and kind of serve them based on what their needs were. But one of my favorite parts about that job was that I got to go in and teach life skills and parenting classes at the Cherokee County Jail. And that was just such a wonderful experience for me, being able to go in there. And I know that's not everybody's scene, but when I grew up, my dad used to have us go sing, me and my brothers, we have to go sing at the youth detention centers just to kind of share Jesus with the kids who were in trouble. And so it wasn't foreign to me, but I got there and I loved being able to kind of equip people with things that they could do as they were processing getting out of jail and things that they could do when they got out. But probably the most important part about it was what I got from them. I got to hear so many stories from so many men and women who had been through various situations. And I heard stories. I heard stories of desperation. I heard stories of brokenness and stories of pain and people who were really in some extreme situations. And so that was really powerful to me. And you find that these people... A lot of them had come to their wit's end in life. They had gotten themselves into situations where they felt like they had run out of options. And we wanted to kind of introduce to them, or they felt like that they were at their last resort. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And when you think about that concept of the last resort, it's simply asking the question, where do you go when you run out of options? And today we're going to dive into a story of a person who had done just that. They had run out of options. We're going to hear a story of a person who experienced Jesus as their last resort. Now, there's a common phrase that I think many of us have probably used throughout our lives or at least heard. And the phrase says, desperate times call for desperate measures. Have any of you all ever used that or or heard that or found that to be true? And it's a very common phrase that's used, but I wonder, you know, how do you know that a situation is really desperate? You know, how do you know when you have actually truly run out of options? And typically, we start to kind of hear people use phrases that start with words like, I am going to lose it if I don't, or I've just got to X, Y, Z, or if I could just do this, then my life would change and things would be better. But we also know that every desperate situation to one person could seem not desperate to another person. You know, you could hear that story and be like, that's not a desperate situation. But to them, it's extremely desperate. I had a son who thought he was in a desperate situation once, and it had to do with a girl. (laughs) Right, it always has to do with a girl, right? So 
my son got the privilege of being able to go to a boarding school for high school in Chattanooga, Tennessee, the Macaulay School. And it was just a, a, a situation that I did not see coming, but he got the opportunity. And so he was in the ninth grade and he was away at school and he was coming home one weekend. And I had to go sing out of town in California. And so I had my brother come stay at the house and I talked to my son. I said, hey, I'm not gonna be home, but you know what the rules are. I said, I know you met this girl this past summer. You cannot go see her. You just can't. One of my rules was, and I thought it was a really great rule, if you can't drive, you can't date. Those were the rules. If you can't pay and get yourself there, then you can't go yet. You just haven't reached the point where that's a privilege for you. And so he's like, come on, mom, please. I got to see her. I haven't seen her in a while. I was like, absolutely not, sir. You cannot. Oh, okay, all right. So he goes through the weekend and I'm away doing my thing and he's here. And so I'm on my way back and I just landed and I get in my car and my son is already headed back to Chattanooga. And so I give him a call and I say, hey, Chris, you know, how was your weekend? He said, oh man, it was great. I said, well, what'd you do? He said, I hung out with the fam. I met some friends or whatever. And I went to church this morning. Man, church was great. And I was like, okay, wonderful. I'm so glad that, you know, you had a great time and I'm sorry that I missed you, but I'll talk to you soon. So we get off the phone and I call my brother to let him know I'm on my way home. And I talk to my brother. I say, hey, how were the boys this weekend? He said, oh, they were good. You know, they didn't give me any trouble. You know, I dropped Christopher off at the movies to see his girlfriend. And I was like, whoa, whoa, <laughs> hold up. Wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry, say that again. And he was like, huh? And I was like, you did what? He said, well, that's his, I mean, he's 15. You know, that's his girlfriend. I figured you wouldn't mind. I was like, boy, you knew I would mind. Why would you do something like that? And then, so now my son's desperate situation caused a desperate situation for me. So I told my brother, I said, well, look, you're going to have to hang out at the house for a little while longer because I'm about to make a trip to Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I get in my car from the airport and I go straight up 75 all the way up to the Macaulay School. And I told him, I said, and don't you call your nephew and tell him I'm coming. I need the element of surprise to be on me. And so I make the drive and I pull up to the school and I get there and I call him again. And he picks up the phone. He's like, hey, mom, you know, hey, how you doing? I was like, I'm good. He's like, well, what's up? I said, well, I wanted to ask you a question. Is there anything about this weekend that you need to tell me about? He was like, no, I had a good weekend. I went to church this morning. I was like, okay. I said, well, I need you to come downstairs now. And he says, what? I said, I am here, come here now. You know, I put my mommy voice on. And he comes downstairs and he's shaking in his boots like, you know, why are you here at my school at eight o'clock at night? And I said, um, we need to talk about this weekend. And so he was now confronted with me. And the fact that I made the trip, he knew he was in trouble. And so finally, he kind of broke down and he told me. And he was like, Mom, he used that, that phrase. He was like, Mom, I just had to see her. I just had to do it. And what I realized is that he didn't care. It's like he was willing. What He wanted to see her so badly. He had placed so much value on connecting with this girl that he was willing to do whatever it took. And it, no matter what it cost him, he was willing to do it. And what we find or what I discovered in that and when I thought about it is this. is In times of desperation... Your level of determination is based on the value placed on what you desire. And we all place a value on lots of different things. We place value on success. We place value on building wealth and building healthy relationships. We place value on having a healthy body and being physically fit. And then there's often times where there's some people who place value on things that some of us may take for granted, things like food or shelter or opportunity or safety. And there's a story that is introduced to us in the book of Mark chapter 5 that we're going to take a look at today. And if you look round about chapter 21, we're introduced to this man by the name of Jairus. And Mark introduces him by name and says that he's a synagogue leader. So this is a man of status and position in the city. And he has this situation that's going on. His daughter is sick. And he's so desperate to get 
his daughter well, and he places such a high value on that, that he leaves where he is and he goes to where this man named Jesus is and he falls at Jesus's feet on his knees and he begs Jesus, the, the scripture tells us that he begs Jesus, would you please come with me to my home and heal my daughter? And Jesus in all of his awesomeness says, absolutely, you lead the way. And so they start this journey to Jairus' house. But along the way, they are intersected by another story. And that is the story that we're going to focus on today. They're intersected by this woman who also was in a very desperate situation. A woman who had placed a high value on what she needed as well. And what she needed more than anything was freedom. And so we're going to take a look at her story, and there are three key components, three key elements that brought her to this place of freedom that we're going to examine. And the first thing is desperation. She was a desperate woman. And in Mark 5, chapter, uh, Mark chapter 5, verse 25, it says, And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. So we're looking at her level of desperation. And I want to take a, a deeper dive into this and kind of examine her level of desperation. First of all, she's identified as a woman. Unlike Jairus, who is identified by name and by his position, he's identified as a synagogue leader. This is just simply a woman who has no name, and she's identified by her condition. So we look at that, and we look at Jairus. We look at this man who is a synagogue leader. He's, he's a person of status and position, and he was actually coming to Jesus on behalf of his daughter. His sick daughter didn't have to leave her house. She didn't have to go anywhere because her daddy, this man of status and position, left where he was to go to Jesus. But this woman was all alone, a woman identified by a condition with no name. And in addition to that, she was ceremonially unclean. What do you mean by that, April? Well, back in this day, in the Hebrew uh, culture, there were a lot of rules. If you look back in Genesis, you'll see all these rules. But one of the things that made a person unclean was the very issue that she had. She had an issue of blood. She had this blood issue that was going on. And because of that, it made her unclean. Not only did it make her unclean, but it made everything she came in contact with unclean. If it was a person she came in contact with, that person was unclean. Their clothes were unclean. And everything had to be purified in order to become clean again. And so with that, that means if she's dealing with this unclean condition for 12 years, this woman is unable to worship at the temple. She's unable to go to the market and buy her own food. She is ostracized from the community. She essentially is a social outcast. And to make matters worse, she was enduring extreme suffering. It says she had suffered a great deal under many doctors, and she spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. So she was poor, she was destitute, she was broke, and she had nothing to show for it. She was no better. And so we see her level of des desperation. And the next element that we see in her story is her faith. And so we're going to take a look at verse 27. In verse 27, it says this. It says, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Oh, my gosh. Think of, I mean, consider the faith of that statement. All I have to do is touch him. She didn't know very much about who he was, but she told herself, if I could just touch his clothes, I would be healed. And what I love about that is that what she heard about Jesus was so impactful that it sparked a hope into her desperate situation, which ignited faith. And when we look at Romans 10, 17, it says faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word 
about Christ. So I have a question I would like to ask you. When was the last time hearing about Jesus increased your faith? I'll take it a step further. When was the last time you shared about Jesus and increased someone else's faith? I mean, think about it. It's like reviews. I don't know about you, but every time I go out of town, without fail, I am going to pull up Yelp because I want the good food. I want to know where the best catfish is. I want to know who serves the best collard greens and mac and cheese. Like, I want to go where the barbecue is slamming. And so I look up Yelp because Yelp means these people have already tried it. They've tasted and seen that the food is good. And they have made these reviews, and so I can trust that. And I'm going to take my chances there more than I would take my chances anywhere else. Why? Because I'm not going to waste my time or my money or my energy on some place that's not good. Right? That's what we do. We look that up. And it's so funny because it reminds me of something that I experienced growing up in my church back home. We used to have this thing called testimony service. And in testimony service, this was a time of the service where there was a microphone just kind of set out and anybody could come up to this microphone and they could tell everybody what God had done for them that week. And I remember as a little girl just kind of sitting with such anticipation to hear what somebody was going to say because you never knew what somebody was going to say. Everybody didn't know how to tell their testimony right. <laughs> but they would get up there anyway. And they would grab that mic and they would just share their stories. And you would hear so many things about how we didn't have any more food in the house. And then all of a sudden, our neighbor just came to the house and dropped off all this food. Or how their son was sick and that the people came and they prayed for him and he was healed and just all these different things. And it was so exciting and it ignited faith in every person that heard. And it was these types of story that gave me faith when I needed it the most, when I became this woman. You see, I grew up in the faith. I grew up learning and knowing about Jesus and going to church and hearing all the Bible stories. And I believed at a very young age and I knew that God was real and I accepted Jesus into my life. But walking that thing out wasn't always easy. And so by the time I was 20 years old, I had become a mother of two. I had my oldest son when I was 17 years old. And then I had my youngest son when I was 19. And I was all by myself. I mean, both dads just dipped immediately. I remember being in college and I went up to my son's father and I told him that I was pregnant and it was a hard thing to do. And he was like, yo, I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't want any kids. You're on your own. And he would literally walk past me on campus like he didn't even know me. Like he didn't even know me. And I felt so ashamed walking around with this big belly and I'm the one who's exposed and he's just playing football. You know what I mean? Nobody ever knew. And so I carried around a lot of shame, but by God's grace, I, I went to college. I finished college. I was at Georgia Southern University, and I promise you, my kids were like the mascots because they went everywhere I went. And we finished, I say we finished college because we did. They were both at my graduation, and then we moved up here to Atlanta. And all I really knew to do, I was trying to make it, and I used every bit of public assistance that was available to me. Right now, I've got student loans still out the wazoo because I used all the money they would give me just to live, just to make sure I could feed my kids, just to make sure that I could provide a life for them. But I came up here to Atlanta, and we started living, and all I knew to do was to keep trusting God. That's all I had. I couldn't trust dads. I couldn't trust these, you know, other people. All I knew was to trust God. And my parents would always tell me, baby, just trust God. And I did. And I kept pressing my way. And I took them to church. And I taught them everything I knew. We watched all the veggie tales in the world. And we just, we, we did our thing. But it was hard. And down through the years, I piled on so much shame and so much guilt for what I had done, for decisions I had made. I felt guilty every time my son asked me, Mom, where's my dad? Mom, why is he not here? Mom, what did I do? Why, why doesn't he love me? Mom, how come we can't play this sport? Well, baby, I don't have the money. I can't afford it. And it broke my heart. And not even just in society and just regular parenting things, but even at church, I'd go to church and you see this picture perfect frame of the mom and the dad and the kids and everything looked so wonderful, but that wasn't me. My story was different. And then they'd have call for singles. They'd have these huge singles events. Well, 
I'm single, I think, but I got some kids, and I, can they come? <laughs> it, it, it wasn't for them either. And so I found myself in this place where I just, I felt so guilty and so ashamed. And every time they had a parent night, it's just me. I remember even when my son was trying to get into school, they kept asking me for both parents' financials. And I was like, all you're gonna get is mine. And I literally had to write a letter and say, look, you're not gonna get any information from that dad because he doesn't even pay child support. So I'm sorry. But God carried me through that, but I carried so much shame and so much guilt. But just like this woman, I was in a desperate situation. Just like this woman, though, I had this faith that I had heard down through the years and this encouragement that I had heard in this scripture that I read my whole life that said, if you keep trying Jesus, he's going to work out for you. He will make a way for you. But I was in this desperate situation. And just like this woman, I was reaching out to God with every time I went to church was me reaching out to God. And we see in this story that this woman is reaching out to God. We see that she presses her way through the crowd. She makes her way. She didn't get the luxury of staying at home and somebody going on her behalf. She had to go out with her unclean self and just press her way to Jesus. And she finally got to him and she touched him. And then in verse 29, it says this, immediately... Her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. What an amazing thing. Like, yes, she got it. She was there. Story over. But no, just when we think that's the end of the story, Mark blesses us with this final scene that I absolutely love. Now, we've seen her desperation. We've seen the depths of her desperation, and we've seen her faith on display and demonstrated. And then there's one final component that we see in her story, and that is truth. In verse 30, it says, at once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? Really? And the disciples said, you see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. And then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And you look at that, and I'm, I'm thinking, I'm like, that's, that's a great story. But I, I have a question about one of the lines in here. It says, trembling with fear. Why is she trembling with fear? But then I thought about it. Think about the implications of what she had just done. She is ceremonially unclean, and she just touched a rabbi. This means that his clothing, according to the law, is unclean now. What would he do to her? He could expose her. He could do anything he wanted to her. He was a rabbi. And not just that, what if she tells, she tells this truth? What are the people going to say? What if somebody realizes, wait a minute, I felt her pressing past me to get to him. And they're like, I'm unclean now. What could happen? The implications were huge. And then I said, well, if that's the case, why would Jesus even ask the question? Why would he even go that far if he knew what those implications were? But I, what I realized is that there was something different, obviously, about this touch. When you look at that text, it says that, you know, the, the disciples asked you, what do you mean? There's people pressing all around you. So obviously, he was getting a lot of touches. But there was something special about this touch. So special that it invoked power from him so strong that he said, no, 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 no. I have to expose this. We need, everybody needs to know about what happened. Everybody needs to know about this experience. And Jesus knew that. And so I believe he set her up to tell her story. He set her up to tell her testimony, to tell the entire truth. And why would he do that? He wanted to do that for the crowd. I think the crowd needed to know, and Jesus know, they need to know what just happened. And not only them, she needed to have this opportunity to step outside of her shame and take this leap of courage 
to go and tell the world, everyone around, the fullness, it said the whole truth of what had happened. And to think about it, how else would anybody know what happened if she didn't talk about it, if she didn't tell the whole story? And I love, love, love how Jesus responds to her. In verse 34, it says, he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. How beautiful is that? After she poured all of her junk out, she exposed herself. She told all her dirty laundry to this man. It says she told the whole truth, nothing but the truth, like all of it. And his response to her was, daughter, not unclean woman, not woman with no name, but daughter, your faith has healed you. And he did just that. Not only did he heal her body, but he freed her mind, body, and soul. And when I saw that story, I connected so immediately because just as I told you, I spent years and years just piling on shame. But I kept going to church and I kept doing the things that I knew to do. I was serving and I was in my small groups and I did all the things. And there was this one season of my life where I was the worship director at a church. And so back in 2010, I took this team to a worship conference in Texas. And it was being hosted by Israel Houghton. I don't know if y'all know who Israel Houghton is, but he's one of my favorites. You know, and I love his, I like up, upbeat songs, like stuff that makes you move. Lord, you are good. And that's, that's what I like. And so we're in this conference, and I mean, the lights were up, and the sound was blasting, and everybody was just jumping, and it was the best thing ever. And we were all enjoying this conference and this music and this worship. And then at the end of the night, he quieted everybody and had everybody take a seat, just like you're sitting now. And the room got real still, and the lights went down, and it was real calm. And it was just Israel Houghton with a guitar and maybe a cajon. It was very calming. And he started to sing this song that hadn't come out yet. It was a brand new song. And he said, from first to last, you knew my days. Future and past, you saw everything. When I would fail, when I would win, when I would need grace to start again. Nothing surprises you. Nothing surprises you about me, Jesus. Nothing that I could do. Nothing could separate you from me, Lord. You see me, you know me, you love me madly. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, whoa. And all of a sudden, I feel this knot just start stirring in my gut. And it moves up my chest into my throat. And then these tears start to well up behind my eyes. And this something was happening to me. And I'm trying to hold it together. And in the midst of that silence, he goes to the bridge and he says, you're not mad at me. You're not mad at me. You're more than enough. And you're madly in love with me. And as he said those words, this girl, (gasps) I wailed. Oh my gosh, I lost it. And in that moment, people started turning and looking at me like, what is wrong with this girl? But I had experienced a touch from Jesus in that moment. In that moment, I didn't care about anything else. Nobody knew what I had gone through. Nobody knew the shame that I had experienced year after year after year. The burden that I carried as a single mom being looked at as a person that did it all wrong. They didn't know But in that moment, just like this woman, I had reached the hem of his garment. And in that moment, I felt that power, that same power based on my faith. I felt that power hit me in that moment with those words. For the first time, I heard Jesus say to me, daughter, not single teenage mom, daughter, your faith 
has healed you. You're persistently going to church. You're persistently reading that word. You're persistently leading worship and singing, Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. You're consistently leading other people to a place that you kind of dove into at home all by yourself with your tears and your crying. You're consistently being a part of your small group, taking your kids to children's church. Your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. And I thought about that, be freed from your, what do you, what do you mean be free? <laughs> be free, live in your freedom. So he didn't just heal her body, but healed everything. And he did the same thing for me. At that moment forward, my life changed. Did I get married the next year? No. None of that happened, but that's the thing. Marriage wasn't the ultimate goal. The goal was my freedom, freedom from my shame and my guilt. And that is what he did. I stayed a single mom for 23 years before I ever got married. And that was okay. I knew I had God and I had purpose and I had a call on my life and I will do this. I will keep going. And I will tell anybody you give me opportunity to about what God has done for me. And it's just the beginning. But just like he did it for her and he's done it for me, if I took the mic out in the audience and I passed it around, we'd hear story after story after story about people reaching the hem of his garment and feeling the transformative power of Jesus to free them from a past and free them from sin and shame. And so my prayer for you today is that this daughter of Jesus' story illuminates this hope in you, that as you face the challenges of life, that you would remember these words, that desperation, faith, and truth poured out to Jesus brings healing and freedom. And even though Jesus was her last resort and my last resort even, he also instantly became her launching pad into the rest of her life, a life of freedom. And God wants nothing more than the same for you. God wants nothing more than for us to be free. He wants us to be free from our suffering, free from our pain, free from shame and fear and sin. That's what he desires for us. And being free is simply living free. It's like walking in the freedom. It's, all, it's like all of a sudden my head is held up high. Now I don't walk around with my head held down. When I have my kids, we're all walking around. It's just the three of us, but our heads are held high. And I'm no longer ashamed of the story that God has written on my life because there's nothing to be ashamed about because God took what was crazy and jacked up to somebody else and he's created this beautiful tapestry for his glory, for his honor, just like he did for this woman. And so if you're here today and you're a Jesus follower, I wanna encourage you to do just that. Be free. Walk in the freedom and the liberty that God has given you as a follower of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that he whom the Son has set free is free indeed. It's like, you're free. Yeah, be free. There's so much liberty in it. And there's so many things that you can discover about yourself when you really just start to step into and walk in the freedom that God has given you. And if you're here and you're exploring faith and you've heard all these stories about Jesus, and I know it's stirring in you and you've got questions, we wanna help you answer those questions. But I wanna invite you today to consider Jesus as your last resort. And also considering, consider him as your launching pad into the rest of your life of freedom. And I wanna challenge each and every one of you. You all have a story. I dare you, even this week, go tell somebody a piece of your story. Watch God ignite faith in somebody else as you share what God has done for you. Big or small, it's all him. He does it all. He causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So would you let God be 
your last resort and your launching pad into a life of freedom. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for who you are. You are such an amazing God. You are the master crafter. And what you build is solid as a rock. And God, you are building in us a faith and a trust in you like we have never known. So for God, for those of us who are struggling and walking in the freedom that you've given us, God, help us to be free in you. Help us to acknowledge and walk out to who you've created us to be. And Lord, not to hold on to any shame, to not go back to what was, but to boldly go where no man has gone before. And that is the journey that you've set out for us to bring glory and honor to your name. And God, for those who have questions, God, I pray that you answer those questions. I pray that you would meet each and every person right where they are and draw us closer to you and help us, God, to walk out this freedom. Give us faith. Give us strength and courage, oh God, to be the men and women that you have created us to be. And help us to share with others the story that you're writing in our lives. And so that faith can be multiplied in every area of our lives with every person that we come in contact with. And God, we'll make sure that we give you all praise and all glory and all honor for it. Why? Because you deserve it all. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.